hour for you there. Happy Halloween, boo! I am actually off to a party, like I think I'm young or something. Um, so I thought I would do my preamble now, and then when I get back we can watch the fight together. How about them apples? Best laid plans and all that. <laughs> is one of those dream matchups that has been completely overshadowed by UFC 280 and the immense like odyssey of time that they made us wait for that fight and how incredible the card was and how <laughs> dramatic the whole evening was. I've Calvin Cater is fighting Arnold Allen and no one's even freaking talking about it. So I'm gonna talk about it. I am a huge fan of both of these guys. I'd say like historically, due to the fact he's just a more active fighter, I've probably gained more emotionally from Calvin Cater because he's been in so many notable wars. But when Arnold Allen shows up, He's skilled, he's wild, he's funny, he's British, which shouldn't count for shit. We always just kind of hope that they're gonna do what? National pride and all that. Alan's performance on that first UFC London card of this year, 2022, in case anyone's dug this out from the history books, because it's definitely going in there. His performance at, on that London card was a highlight amongst a night of Freaking highlights. Remember when he slipped and carried on fighting? Remember how fast he jumped on that finish when he realised that Hooker was hurt? Alan is out to prove to all of us that he is not a decision guy. And I don't know about you, <laughs> I ain't gonna stop him. Now Arnold was pretty much one of the only fighters that didn't return for the July card in London, but it wasn't really a surprise as he pretty much only fights once a year. But now our disappointment can dissolve as we have been gifted this delicious, juicy peach. After that hooker fight, Arnold called for Calvin, saying he thinks it's a fan friendly fight, he thinks it's the one to get him in the top five. He thinks it's a good matchup stylistically and at least Calvin isn't as tall as Hooker, which is Summit. And he also said, and this is some big talk, he said that he thinks he's a better boxer than Calvin. That's gonna be a good fight. Now he's certainly got the background and the breeding to back up those fighting words. If you didn't know, the Allen family was bred for athletic competition, maybe even constructed, concocted in a lab somewhere. It is Halloween after all, guys. I'm pretty sure their family crest has a bicep emblem on it. If you trace the etymology of the word Alan, it would probably mean man of stone, able to move mountains. I'm pretty sure if you looked back at the family history, the very first Alan would have just been like an anvil. They're just built different. Arnold's dad, Pacer Allen, was a super accomplished strongman that made the transition to MMA. Now I'm not saying it was a successful transition. In fact, how, after losing two of his three amateur fights, he was even given the opportunity to go pro, I don't know. And in fact, when he went pro, he won one, lost one, and then bowed out. But it did mean that Arnold was immersed in the combat world from a young age. Even if only given an example of what not to do. And that is just as important a teaching from a father to a child as any other. Not too long ago, I did a video on Habib 
and Abdul Manop Nurmagomedov and how Habib's father's combat knowledge and experience and constant presence throughout Habib's training was integral to his success. I'm not saying it's the same with Arnold and Pacer Allen, but Arnold has talked about, at least as a youngster, actually being put off pursuing fighting due to his father's affiliation and, you know, typical teenage shit thinking things aren't cool purely because your parents think that they are. It was a mental barrier that he had to overcome in the early days. And talking of the early days, Arnold and his brother, Jake, who is also following his father's footsteps, but you know, the heavier ones, weighed down by big old rocks and that. Strong, he's a strong man. Strongman, a strong man. They used to watch a lot of wrestling together and practice the moves on one another. And from there, Arnold started boxing, but found it to be too one-dimensional. He has a few fights in both boxing and kickboxing, but eventually it was MMA that stole his heart. Now, strength and conditioning is a part of every fighter's training regimen, but growing up in a family that has such a background and wealth of experience and knowledge in all things strength, power and a family that prioritizes fitness is going to be a huge boon, whatever that means, to Alan's entire career. And he does have that power in his hands. We saw that straight away in the hooker fight. <laughs> Never fails to make me laugh when I say hooker fight. <laughs> Why is he fighting a hooker? On that note, no, that was mean. Take that back. Retracted. But do you remember when he got arrested? Alan, not Hooker, for having a brawl with some, what do they call them? Ch in the Charlie and the Chuck, Oompa Loompas. Part of me doesn't want to elaborate on this story because that is a headline. We'll come back to it. Alan does train with his brother and dad or at least soak up their knowledge and gain the motivational benefits of being surrounded by like-minded people. But Arnold is smart enough to know that his sport has different demands to his brothers, and he needs a strength and conditioning program that is designed to build strength behind the technique, putting power behind his punches instead of weighing them down. And to do that, he's worked with William Waylaid for most of his career. They do a lot of compound lifts, like your squats, your bench, your Romanian deadlifts, to build strength, as well as stability and mobility exercises to help prevent injuries. But he doesn't stop there when it comes to surrounding himself with the right people to get him where he wants to go, the best possible training partners, the access to all that knowledge that he can soak up that he's gonna need across his career in combat sport. For a lot of his career, he's trained out of TriStar, and we all know TriStar as the home of Georges St. Pierre. Where the hell did that come from? Get out of here, Georges. But variety is the spice of life. And for the hooker fight, for the Dan Hooker fight, Arnold took the show on the road, moving from gym to gym all around the UK, you know, COVID, but also making lemons, making lemonade, making something citrusy. And he soaked up a lot of skills in our little aisle of the supermarket. He's undefeated in the UFC with the Dan Hooker victory becoming his like 11th straight win which as we spoke about in the 280 pre-show it's not a show get off your eye horse pre-nonsense is a huge win streak and this fight against calvin cater is about to be his first headliner whereas calvin has already headlined five freaking times now i'm not saying that the pressure of this is going to affect Alan in any way, but it is worth noting that he's spoken openly about the anxiety he always feels before a fight and the battles he's had with those negative voices telling him that he's not good enough, that he's never going to win. And it's entirely possible that those voices will get louder uh, in correlation to the... in correlation with? In correlation with the enormity of the situation. 
Now, he counteracts those voices with hard work. And that's a song we've heard many, many times before. But one worth bringing up every single time because all of us could heed these words. Is that heed this advice? Am I Englishing today? Heed these words, young one. Confidence comes from knowing you've done absolutely everything in your power to prepare. Speaking of preparation, Calvin says that his doesn't really change from fight to fight. He works hard every single day to be the best he can be and it doesn't matter who they put in front of him. I'm not going to go into all the ways in which Calvin's New England cartel flavoured preparation differs to Arnold Allen moving from gym to gym because I went over that in the Rob Font vs Cheeto Vera video so I'll just link that one for you on the end screen and you really should check it out because the New England cartel is a unique and a fascinating environment. Now while Alan remains undefeated, Calvin has won three of his last five and is coming into this fight off the back of a split decision loss which many people believe was a fucking robbery. I don't believe it was a robbery, but I do believe it should have been another W for the Boston finisher. I'm not going to labour the point, but it was the fourth round of that fight that was largely contested, with only one judge scoring it for Emmett, but in doing so, tipping the scale. And in that fourth round, Emmett hardly landed any clean shots. They did appear to be bigger shots, but they didn't appear to do any damage, and were largely blocked. Cater at least landed some clean shots and was racking up the jabs as he do. Then towards the end of the round, Cater landed that nice spinning elbow. Then a 1-2 that gave Emmett something to think about. And a headache the next day, I bet. There was no grappling to judge. And Cater should have got the nod on damage, on control. And the only area that I can see that Emmett might have outdone Cater was in aggression. That's too far down the list, babes. I bring it up. And definitely didn't labour it, right? Because it might mean that we see the Boston finisher really trying to go for that finish. A lot of the time when fighters lose such a close fight like that, they make a decision in their minds to not let the next one or any of the next ones be put in the hands of the judges. Another thing to mention is it's been quite a short camp for both guys, but Calvin thinks that's just the way things are going. But it might also mean that they don't want to see the full five rounds because they don't want their cardio to be tested in such a manner. Basically, I'm just praying that these two implement their high level striking skills, but with an air of swang and bang. I want both technique and I want madness. Is that too much to ask? Right, I'm gonna go with this party. And I'll see ya when I see ya. Like I said, we've got a couple of boxes striking matchup here, I imagine. We've seen Cater's incredible evolution in recent fights. Like, when he's standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with another striker. For Giga, he brought the Hellbows in order to carve Chikadze's face to pieces. So let's see what he gives us tonight. Alan is a southpaw. We haven't actually seen Cater fight a southpaw in the UFC. So that's something to look for, how he adjusts to that. Obviously he will have been training for it. Kata's jab is mechanically perfect and fun fact, so is mine. He tends to um, keep his hands super tight, extending the jab from temple to nose without any warning sign at all. He's just so freaking quick with it. 
and he uses it so effectively to set up other shots, like adjusting to his opponent's reads and throwing exactly the right shots to make them do what he wants them to do. He mixes in that right low kick really well with the jab to follow and he tends to um, aim for the head until he's got a read, which is what he's looking to do now. They're both looking to do that, both figuring each other out. Oh, but Alan connected there. And then um, he'll start bringing in more of his head movement and body shots. Alan uh, likes to throw the one too heavy and frequently either using his jab or controlling his opponent's hand to make way for that big cross. He's good at doubling up with his shots as well. We're not really seeing that yet. They're both just kind of throwing single when they are throwing. He'll either do like a slick double jab or a left straight followed by some footwork and left to the body he likes to throw as well. In fact, his body work is beautiful and something to be on the lookout for. Oh, there's a nice sharp shot from Kata. Lots of that signature Allen movement in the hooker fight. Allen was so evasive, his movement was on point and he really baited Dan with the feints and frustrated him and made him throw. Flurry from Allen, hooker-esque. Pace has picked up. is trying to work his way in, pressing forward. Alan's timing there, he keeps landing that left. Beautiful, oh! Oh no, 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 oh! What happened? God freaking damn it. Got ourselves an injury. So frequent, is it more often at the moment? Does it just feel that way? He's up, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> Doctor says we're continuing, so we're continuing. Alan could be looking already, just without that knee injury, to counter Kate's jab with low kicks as they leave his lead leg exposed. And now, if he can eat away at that lead leg, he can impact Calvin's movement, which is obviously already come from, oh. Well, that sucks absolutely hate it like obviously alan hates it kata hates it it doesn't answer any of our questions like well done alan was looking great in that first round but anything could have happened in fact should we talk about what could have happened so if it came down to any kind of grappling alan probably had the edge so he would have been smart to play for the takedowns or work in the clinch but still Staying really aware of Calvin's elbows. He's a shorter fighter than Calvin, so he would have need to focus on closing the distance, but we know he's got that footwork, he's got that movement. Um, we just don't know about his cardio. We've not seen him in five rounds before. Um, side note, and it may not have had any kind of impact, but boy likes to eat his, from what I've seen, and I don't see everything, but he does like to indulge, and I don't just mean on meal deals, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what toll that takes on the body and the cardiovascular system. Just a little fun fact. Kata was a really talented wrestler in high school, but we don't see a lot of it in his game plans. These days he has proven to be a good defensive wrestler, but offensively? It's just like he just shines on the feet and he knows it. Another kind of thing we might have seen if it had gotten into the later rounds is obviously Kata tends to stay more active. He's had many more five round fights and maybe he could have exhausted Alan if it had made it into those later rounds like he did with Giga and had more success. If we'd have seen that far, maybe these two can run it back and we'll see. Remember I mentioned uh, the Oompa Loompas? <laughs> Shall I elaborate? I shall. Alan faced the prospect of losing his license and his ability to fight outside of the UK being taken away, potentially not even being able to travel to Canada to train because he got in a fight with a bunch of Oompa Loompas. Okay, I'm embellishing for fun. So apparently he was at a Christmas party with his girlfriend and it was one of those massive corporate ones where basically a whole ton of organisations are all under the same roof. and. Under that same roof, there was like spec savers were there or something, and a like a bunch of Willy Wonka fans. I don't know. Whatever. 
floats your goat. Basically, his girlfriend got into a scuffle. He stepped in and, according to reports, ran amok. Love that for him. Uh, did that fight just uncover the next contender for Volk? Alan doesn't seem to think so. But with Volk's eyes on the belt at the higher weight class, staring lovingly at the man of all of our dreams, you know, he might be out a while, so maybe we'll see that interim. But Volk also says he plans on being very active in both weight classes, and I believe him. Following the wasteland that was the fight schedule last month, this month is a rolling stone gathering absolutely no freaking moss. And we refuse to be left behind, right? Next week we're going to be looking ahead at, hopefully, injury-free. UFC 281 card, as if we've even had a second to recover from 280. So, come out, hang out here again, or I'll be mad. Hang out every day on Insta, Twitter now. Like this video, subscribe to this channel, and, uh, you know, um, find me on OnlyFans.